Hello, and welcome to VOW, Voices of Wisdom, the show that might not be for everybody, but everybody needs to watch this show. And I'm your host, Brenda Simmons. VOW is about relationships. Relationships are universal simply because they are all that exists. Nothing has meaning until you decide how it relates to you and how you relate to it. It is the process of making these associations that we determine the outcome of our experiences in life. And today I have on my show, we're going to talk about diversity, a diversity project. And we're going to talk about the relationship that we have with diversity and even in the medical field. And today I have on my show today is Dr. Barbara Messina. How are you today, darling? I'm um, wonderful. Thank good, you. Good, 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 good. First of all, I'd like to say, Barbara and I go back, we were schoolmates. That's right. And um, we're going to tell them how long ago it's been, or we're not going to tell them how long it's been? We can tell them. I'm very proud to say that I have known Brenda Simmons since 1970 throughout my whole life. We graduated high school in 73. And one of the reasons I did this diversity project, because Brenda doesn't even realize that when I was in high school and I watched her and her struggle with diversity and being a black student in a white world, it opened my eyes. And it had a wow. profound impact on me. For real? For real. Wow. Wow. OK, let me regroup. All right, Dr. Messina, you are a doctor at Stony Brook? I'm a PhD. I'm a nurse. Okay. I started out in BOCES in Riverhead. Okay. And just liked school and liked being nursing and liked education, so I went and got my degree. Just kept working. I graduated high school in '73, and I finished my doctoral degree in '99. Awesome, awesome. And what schools did you go to? Everything was in Stony Brook? No. I went to BOCES, became an LPN. I worked as an LPN. I went to Farmingdale uh, for two years. I'm my associate. My bachelor's degree at CW Post, my master's in NP at Stony Brook, and my doctoral degree at Adelphi. Awesome, awesome. So we really want to talk about this project because I know it's very dear to you. And um, sorry that Lori, uh, Dr. Lori Escalera couldn't yeah. be here. She got sick today. But she did. We don't want to say hi to her. Um, but tell me, tell, let's talk about this diversity project that's so dear to you. Okay, well, as, as I said, when we were young and we were in high school, um, I can remember watching you and many other friends of ours that we went to school with. So I won't mention their names because I don't know if they want their names mentioned. But their first names, Richard and Nancy and yeah. Peggy and yeah. all these different people go to school. And my mom, God rest her soul, had always said, you know, when you have children, you never stop worrying. And I'm so glad that my children, we were fortunate enough to be white. And I said, why do you say that, mom? And she said, because the black kids have it, a mother who has a black child must just be horrified every day. And I thought that was a terrible thing to say. But as I got older and then I saw different things you were doing, I remember you had the first African-American day at the high school, mm -hmm. which I thought was so cool, but yet so sad because why did you have to fight for it? Like, what's, exactly. what's the, I don't get it. Mm. So when I was going to school, I always worked. I went to school. And at one point, I was living in the projects in Hempstead. And I saw a lot of people there, very nice people. And I realized the only difference between them and me was hope. And I had hope because I was white. And they had hope. They didn't have hope because they didn't have a role model to go to. You know, I had delayed gratification because I knew if I got my degree, I could have a better life. But even if they got their degree, they'd have to fight. Many of them didn't have that better life. So I always wanted to be a nurse, like I said. And when I got, I always said to myself, when I get in a position and I can do something about it, I'm going to do something about it. So um, uh, Dr. Lori Escalera, a colleague of mine, had asked me if I wished to participate in a grant with her. And we put in for the Cultural Diversity Project. And the purpose of that project was to recruit nurses of color um, into the healthcare field because 70 to 80% of nurses are white. Mm -hmm. 
and we have all these wonderful initiatives. We have Healthy People 2000. You have all these wonderful things. And then you, you hear, gee, we have mammography screaming. We have this. We have that. And these people aren't coming. Well, mm -hmm. maybe these people aren't coming because we don't understand what their needs are. Mm -hmm. We have to understand their needs. And you don't understand until you walk in another person's shoes. Right, right. So we have been very fortunate with HRSA and with Robert Wood Johnson. We just put in for another round, and hopefully, God willing, we'll get it, um, to educate nurses of color, to put them back into their communities to help care for um, uh, their own communities mm -hmm. because they can understand the right. needs right. the way I may think I may understand. I really don't understand. You know, Barbara, it's so profound to me because I worked... Um, as a family development worker before I had my job here, which I have, I mean, my, before I had my job that I'm doing now. And um, <clears throat> the most of my consumers were, not all, but most of them were um, African-American people, you know, young moms with children. And there were times where I would meet with other um, colleagues or other departments or other um, companies or organizations on the different topics that we were dealing with, whether it was homelessness or was feeding, you know, feeding them or you know whatever, and that came up one time, and I said that to a group of people. The majority was white. I said to them, I said, most people like to see themselves. I said they like to, they can relate to. I said, well, we can't. Sometimes they don't open up to us, and we can't relate to them. They don't relate to us. I said because it's a, it's something that's more comfortable. You know, and they feel like maybe you don't really understand. They might be having some struggles at home, but they can't say that to you because you don't really understand that. So we talked about that, and, and, and you feel the same way? I do. Mm -hmm. I do. There's, there's a, to me, I wish there's a great book that was written that's called The Color of Water. Mm. I don't know if you've read that book. Mm -mm. And that's what I think skin color should be. It should be the color of water. It's colorless. Mm. But unfortunately, society puts different, obstacles in the way because it's one of the reasons I'm so happy that Obama is president mm -hmm. because we say it's the land of opportunity and we all have equal opportunity mm -hmm. but all the presidents before them there wasn't a role model for a little black boy or a little black girl to say well maybe I can really do that mm -hmm. now they really can do that because they mm -hmm. know it's possible mm -hmm. so and I think that happens in healthcare. You have people who, uh, and that, that just, it's such, it's such common sense to me, I don't understand it. I mean, isn't that the reason for a support group? If, if you have, that we have cancer support groups, we yeah. have widow support groups, mm -hmm. we have grieving support <coughs> groups, we have all sorts of support groups. Mm -hmm. Because I can, where you may empathize with me, you can't sympathize with me because you haven't been in my shoes. Right. So you don't get it. Right. So I go to a support group who gets it. Mm -hmm. So I can say it and, and you understand it and there's a common bond. It would make sense to me if, if there's a white nurse and a black patient that there's, there may be a barrier between mm -hmm. that Maybe the white nurse would understand it, mm -hmm. but, but maybe because of circumstances that have surrounded that individual's life for their entire life, they feel that she's never going to understand me because mm -hmm. she just doesn't know mm -hmm. what my mm -hmm. struggles are since the minute I've been born. And you know, and even if that white nurse might understand, that African-American person in their own minds are looking at that person as saying, she doesn't really know, not maybe even given her that even, uh, you know, point or option or even the benefit of thinking that she does. So no, no, either side is still a barrier. That's right. You know, and I also, I was just thinking, I also remember when I brought this up, there were people and they got very offended because they had their, you know, doctor's degrees and all that kind of stuff. And I, at that time, I think, I think I was finishing up my bachelor's degree. So they looked at me like, how dare you say that I'm not qualified to do my job? And that's not what I was trying to say to them. Right. I really wasn't. I wasn't trying to offend anybody. I was just making a clear point. So it was so refreshing to hear you say this. It's almost like, I was like, yeah, yeah you well, get it. Yeah, you well, really get it. Well, a lot of people don't get it. And I think that I've been fortunate in my life maybe to get it because I had a mother who got it mm -hmm. um, and who understood it mm -hmm. and who... Uh, 
put it to us every day. Mm -hmm. And because I grew up with people like you, mm -hmm. who I saw struggle, and I saw different things, and I never quite understood why. Mm. And then you're, you're put into this clinical arena, and you have these patients who are struggling. You have people who are struggling. And it's not that I can't do my job. I'm very competent. I can mm -hmm. do my job very mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. But I can't understand you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just like you can't understand me, mm -hmm. just because you have to, if you acknowledge it, there's no prejudice. That's mm -hmm. the way I look at it. Right. There's right. no barrier. Right. There's no right. culture. Just right. acknowledge what is there. Mm -hmm. you're, if you acknowledge you're a man, I can't really understand a man's point of view. Mm -hmm. So why can't we just, just level the playing field mm -hmm. and just say, look, and, and besides, it used to be a commercial on television. The mind is a terrible thing to waste. Right. So we could change the, for generations to come, mm -hmm. the ability of people to have a better life for themselves, mm -hmm. for their family, mm -hmm. and achieve what the nation's goals want to be. Our nation health care, we want preventative health care. We right. want our people healthy. Mm -hmm. We want our children healthy. Mm -hmm. So if we can put people in the community mm -hmm. who can understand their community mm -hmm. and bring better health care to them, mm -hmm. why don't we do that? Right, right. Just accept it. Right. But you know, it's, 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 you know, on both sides, I would say, it's challenging of the understanding and even given the opportunity to understand. But at the same time, this program is so significant to me, and obviously to you as well, and to Lori, um, because it's really giving people an opportunity that they might not have. I mean, you are actually going out and getting funding to do this, where people actually would have to try to go find a way, maybe get a scholarship or whatever, you which know. Which is very hard. Which is very, extremely hard, extremely hard. And you, you also, you know, making another, another point is there is a lot of health issues in our community. Tremendous. Tremendous a lot, because I used to work in that field as well, you know, with, like I said, being a family development worker. So I knew there was a lot of health issues. But actually to get a person out there, like you said, to help, in those fields, it was very difficult. It was very difficult to even get the funding out there, to get the people out there. So this program is just beyond, you know, what we could use in our community. And to have somebody spearheading a white person, let's be real, let's we gonna be real, right, Barbara? That's it. To really spearhead this and be out there promoting this, it makes a difference. You know? I hope so. Well, part of the, the university, too, it's supporting the mission of the university. This is Stony, Stony Brook. Stony Brook University. We are committed to um, diversity. Mm -hmm. We're committed to providing diversity and education to people who normally couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have afforded a, a private education. Mm -hmm. I only went to Adelphi after I had all this education behind me. Mm -hmm. So it afforded, BOCES afforded me an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're supporting the university mission and goals, and we're supporting our country. I mean, that's what nursing is all about. And you're right. When I, when I did this project, I was born and brought up on Long Island. I'll probably die on Long Island. I didn't realize that the highest rate of poverty is on Suffolk County, 20%. At or below poverty, not the big mansions out on the beach. And that's what's always on the television, at or below poverty. Our own people in Suffolk County, our own people, our women are giving birth to children. Women of color have the highest rate to this day of premature infants and all types of morbidity and mortality associated with that. And we choose to ignore it. We choose to hide behind the big fancy hedges and ignore it. Those people cleaning those houses and waiting those parties need help. And they need to come up out of that. And it's not that it's a bad job. I did it. I am who I am no matter what I did, whether I waited that party or I'm sitting here doing this grant. But you, if somebody needs a help, all they need is for somebody to lend a hand to say, I think just being white, I knew different opportunities, different avenues opened up for me. They may not even know who to go to. Mm -hmm. How do I even get, are right. there grants? Right. How do I apply for that? Mm -hmm. Who would I go to? Mm -hmm. Who'd listen to me? Mm -hmm. A lot of people will. So if you just put your hand out there, you can help people. We can have healthier children, healthier babies. Absolutely. But you know, it's, it's, um, like I said, it's going to be a real show today. We're in 2012 as we speak right now, right. February 2012. And to bring up that we're still having a race issue, people don't want to 
accept that. They don't want to believe that. I mean, we've come, you know, we, I've had a, a gentleman on my show who used to sit in the, he, he experienced sitting in the back of a bus. You know, he says, you know, we've come a long way, you know, and we have. But, you know, even, it, it, this is 2012, to still have to really discuss this, to still have to struggle. And if you the truth be known, it. it's, it's, it's almost more so. You almost see it more now, I think. I don't know. I think maybe, maybe you talk about it more, but it's still there. Yeah. I know it's still there. Because mm -hmm. if, if we wouldn't be doing this grant if it right. wasn't still there. Right. Why would have... Why would it be such a big deal that Obama's a black man who's a president? Who cares? Mm -hmm. Exactly. He's, he's, he's for the, if he's the best man for the job, he's the right. best man for the job. Right. If he's not the best man for the job, he's not the best man right. for the job. Right. But what do they always say? He's our first black president. What has that got to do with anything? Exactly. It has to do a lot. That's why they had Medgar Eggers' wife, widow, sitting there because that man was the first man from the NAAs who got murdered in his own house fighting for the right, mm -hmm. and I hope to God he saw it. Mm -hmm. So all those things he fought for. So yes, we have come a long way, right, right. but it's there. And this is not a community of color. It's right. still very segregated. Go down David White's lane. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody lives over here, and everybody lives over mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And that's still where everybody lives. It's, it's, this is true. So let's talk a little bit more about the details of this program. So how does the program work? How does a person get involved? They get selected? It's a scholarship? How do they? Well, what happens is they normally have their two-year degree. OK. OK. They apply to our program. OK. Um, and we look at uh, minorities in the program, and we look at economics. Okay. And they're recruited into the program, and they receive their baccalaureate degree that's it's paid for, mm -hmm. and they receive their advanced degree, and it's paid for. Really? And then these individuals will go back into their communities, um, and they also, what we try to do, and they, they do work with us, is to work with, um, act as mentors and facilitators to the next group coming oh, in. Oh, wow. Because if you're, um, for example, even our faculty, we had a hunt for a black nurse <laughs> for a faculty, wow. you know? Um, so you need someone who's, 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 like you're saying, a representative who understands them. Mm -hmm. So they then act as mentors to the next group coming in. And what we found is that it's, it's very effective. Mm -hmm. Um, they do go back into the communities, and hopefully down the road we're going to see a, a major change. But we're just trying to get the ball rolling. And you, I think, originally got this grant in 2008? It was yeah. actually, yeah, what are we in, 12? 2005. Yeah. 2005. And then we, then we refund, we got what's called, it's for refunding. Mm -hmm. So we reapplied for continued funding, mm -hmm. and we got more money. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, the total grant, it was a little over 800000 um, so that's another thing that people need to do, abdicate when you vote to put in for education grants yes. for, th for projects like this. Because it's more than just educating that person for the minute. Mm -hmm. You're educating for a lifetime. Absolutely. And you're creating preventative health care. So we can have nurses who will come out, advanced practice nurses, who will go into these poverty areas out here, 20% mm -hmm. poverty, mm -hmm. who can come out and help care for these individuals. There's, there's, a, there's such a profound need, and I know that there's a lot of programs, but I'm very passionate about this, and please vote to continue the funding, mm. this governmental funding that is so vital to our community. You said you just came back from D.C.? Uh, or in, you were in D.C.? Uh, we, we did present in D.C. We... Uh, you know, when you get a HRSA grant, you have to present your findings, and oh, okay, you have to present okay. fundings and give seminars and symposiums. So we did. We were very fortunate. We presented a poster, which is back here, about mm -hmm. our findings. And, mm -hmm. you know, we won Best Poster Award and all oh, these wow. different things. But, but the best award is when those people walk across that stage yes. and you see a change mm. in them mm -hmm. and in their families. Mm -hmm. Uh, who some of them have were uh, families of slaves, of sharecroppers mm -hmm. who came here, and they're mm -hmm. now seeing their family member right. walk across that right. stage right. and get that degree. It's a, it's a, it's a, 
it's, it's a transition and a transformation that you, you cannot describe. It's, it's sometimes I want, like I said to Lori, I don't know who, who's doing better, them or me, you know? Mm. It's like, because it's, it's such a satisfying feeling. Right, right. And when you see them out in the community taking care of these people, that's what really counts. So how do they get back in the community? How do, how do you get them back in the community? They go back to where that's part of the grant. You have to go back into the community from where you're practicing. Many of them are coming from the Bronx, from Queens, mm -hmm. from, from communities that are underserved, mm -hmm. very poor. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the, let's face it, a lot of the nurses too, you're not going to come out into, into the white areas. You're going to be the only black face hanging around. Mm -hmm. So they go into the clinics? How do they go? Do they go into clinics? They right go into back the into their hospitals. Some of them will okay. go to private clinics. Some of them will go to private doctor's offices. Um, some of if you're in a big teaching hospital, they'll take a nurse practitioner role within the hospital. So they may be directly at the bedside taking care of the patient. Mm -hmm. They may be preventative care taking care of the patient. But the bottom line is they have the skill set and the knowledge to go out and to beat the bushes, to go to their congressman, to understand Right. Lobbying and legislation mm -hmm. and that it makes a difference and they know it makes a difference because it did for them. Right. Why am I going to fight exactly. for something that has no, I'm going to fight and fight and fight for you to get it? Mm. Not that I don't want you to have it, mm -hmm. but now they see it makes a difference. Right. So they want to continue that process. So there's, there's so many, it's like a pool that just keeps going out and out and mm -hmm. out. So they go back into the community and they'll fight. They go to Albany and they'll get on a bus on lobby day and they'll go fight because that's what you need. You need, there's power in numbers yes. and we have the power to vote. Mm -hmm. We don't exercise that right, mm -hmm. but you can see that it makes a difference. Yes. So gather everybody together and go up and fight for it. So they're trained to be nurse practitioners or, or different? They can just be, not just be. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I may have my doctoral degree, but like I said, and I, I am a nurse practitioner, but I always say I was born a bedside nurse, I'll die a bedside nurse. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm happy. I'm happy mm -hmm. at that bedside. Many of them choose to stay at the bedside, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Because if I have an African-American woman who's, say, diagnosed with diabetes mm -hmm. or diagnosed with, God forbid, some type of malignancy mm -hmm. or, or whatever, I can come at her or him with this great plan of care. I'm going to lay out the greatest plan of care there is. Then they come back and their blood glucose is still fine. You'll say, oh, they're non-compliant. Yeah. They're just not paying attention. Mm -hmm. But what they don't get is that maybe that woman is a caretaker. I don't know what her finances are. Right. I don't know if she has the ability to get to the pharmacy. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. She may not relay that to me mm -hmm. out of embarrassment mm -hmm. or feeling mm -hmm. humiliated. Right, right. But she may relay it to someone who is of her own mm -hmm. ethnic race and creed because she's going to feel, you understand me. Yes, yes. So we can then get social work involved to help you. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Mm -hmm. So some of them do that. Some of them will go into the clinic. I mean, we may have a whole saying, oh, we have all this mammography and breast cancer and screening, but they don't go. Well, who's going to go if I can't put pampers on my kid? I'm not going to, I have to take care of my child. I don't have formula for my child. I don't have diapers for my child. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me to go get a mammography screening when I'm worried about getting a booster for my kid? Are you kidding me? That's so far from my reality. Right. I don't have a home. I'm living in a, in a hotel in squalor mm -hmm. with no way out. Because if I go to work, then all of a sudden you're going to cut off my food stamps, mm -hmm. which are not going to pay, enough, is enough money for me to survive. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this catch-22 mm -hmm. all the, the time. time. Yes. So you need people to understand that. And you can, who, uh, social workers who can you know, help people, get mm -hmm. them set up. Healthcare providers who are willing to work and can set up and, and you know make arrangements for people. Mm -hmm. That's what you need because there's all these resources that are out there. Stony Brook has so many resources. We have a dental clinic. We have all kinds of screening. We have pediatric clinics. But maybe people don't have transportation to right. get there. Right. Right. You know, so this this you may not say to me. But you may say to someone else. But that's, that's the real, Barbara. That is the real. That's the that truth. That is the real. That is the real. And it's so key because I remember, like I said, working in that field 
as a family development worker where I knew those, I knew those things, you know, and because I was sensitive to or because I walked the shoes. That's right. I was in the shoes. That's right. So I knew, okay, you can't get there. They, they, you have that look, you know, Miss Brenda, I, I know I need to do this, but, and then I know, you know, okay, you need some pampers, right, or you need a couple of dollars to get on the bus, or you need a ride, you know, and it breaks down to that. So for you to really break that down and to see that, okay, this is what a, a, a patient should be doing, but maybe they can't because it's something very, very important that might be menial to anybody else, but we it's take critical. for granted. Exactly. Those are things we take for granted. Exactly. We take for granted that I'm going to have health insurance, I'm going to have a car, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a house, I can put pampers on my baby. Mm -hmm. That's we take for granted. Mm -hmm. So we're starting here mm -hmm. when the patient is here. Right. And right. never the twain shall meet. Right. And all you get written on your record is they're non adherent. They're not adherent. They don't care. They're non compliant. Right. They're in and out of the hospital because they're not paying attention. Well, maybe they're not paying attention because they don't even have the money to get to the pharmacy right. to pay the $5 copay to get right. the insulin. Right. Right. Or they're going to say, you know what, that $5, I'm going to feed my, my child mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that we have 20% poverty in Suffolk County. 20%. That's That's, That's, huge. Huge. That's huge. That's huge. And I, I don't understand why healthcare won't face it because it's not a deficit in my knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's just, I am who I am. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's the, the, to me, it's the simplest thing. This is just simply a support group. That's the way I look at it. That's good. Because you can, you know, like I said, if, I, if, God forbid, you know, my husband passed away, I would, uh, maybe I'd go to a support group for grieving widows. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. nobody's going to understand. You can empathize with me, but you can't sympathize right. with me because you haven't been there. Right. Which is what my mother always used to say. I watched you people go right. through it when I was in school, fighting for what? Yeah. Well, we have 10 seconds left, and um, <laughs> I also know that DAC Medicine, uh, Dr. Claxton, yes. he's reaching out to you to get some of the nurse practitioners that you're yes. training. He's an African-American doctor who's looking for nurse practitioners. So we're working this out. It's, it's working out. It's really going to work out. And um, how many students do you think have gone through your program? We have like 12 seconds left. Oh, my God. Um, Jeez, now you're a mom on the spot. I'm sorry. I don't know. Maybe. But you had a, you had a few, probably fifty, a hundred. Fifty, a hundred. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. great. And we're hoping for another fifty, a hundred. Awesome. So vote for this educational. Do it. Do it. All right. Thank you, Barbara. Dr. Messina. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this has been Val Voices of Wisdom. Thank you, and have a great day.